Hey everyone! In this video, what I'm going to cover is correspondence analysis in R. This is for my Analytics 540 class, which is human language. So to get started, let's see what we're going to discuss today. First, we're going to reanalyze those color terms from the beginning of the semester, looking at the Berlin K theory and categories. So this lecture kind of comes at the end of the semester. We're going to kind of pull together some different topics that we've covered throughout the semester. Thinking a little bit about word choice when it comes to color, and then how might we identify categories. And so mainly that's it, <laughs> actually. Uh, this slide's really short. But um, we'll also look at kind of the final design in our interpretive dance series, thinking about how we can uh, cluster or group or create dimensions and look at how words are related to each other or re word relationships. So that's really what we're covering today. So I'm going to start by just jumping into the analysis because we've already talked about Berlin K and category learning. Um, I'm putting this on my YouTube channel and if you're following along, uh, the rest of the videos will be available soon. It's just been a matter of recording them. So using the Arling library, there's a color register file. And that file has a list of colors as the rows and where uh, those are in their register. Remember, register here means situation. So they're spoken, fiction, academic, or press. And um, what is in this is just a total of the, of the use of those words. So this is a conditional frequency. Um, diagram, or sometimes people like to call this a cross tabs, where it's the frequency of those combinations. So how many times black was in the spoken category and blue was in the fiction category, for example. And a quick reminder from Berlin K theory is that our linguistic interpretation of color has changed over time and that color vocabulary in a language sort of falls into these categories. And as the language progresses, so to speak, what we see is people shifting towards more color distinctions. So languages start with a, a color distinction between white and black, that's the easiest one. Then we tend to add red, green, and yellow, then blue and brown. And when we hit the last level of this sort of linguistic change, what we'll see is more fine grain distinctions, purples, pinks, oranges, and grays. So we're moving from um, big color distinctions to finer point color distinctions. And in this section, I really wanted to focus on chi-square because chi-square underlies many of these analyses that we've covered this semester, especially at the beginning of the semester with like distinct coexeme analysis. Um, and I don't know that it's super obvious that chi-square is underlying all of these. So we're going to end the semester talking about what is chi-square and what has it got to do with, with understanding frequencies. So it's an analysis that tells us if a specific category are different than we might expect. So there's a lot of ways to treat chi-square, but its main question is if the number in this cell is what we might expect given a hypothesis or not. And I pulled out a little two by two here to uh, really explore how that's calculated when it's a chi-square independence test. So chi-square goodness of fit tests only have one row or column. And in that test, you can examine if those categories are different than one might expect. And you can say, I expect them all to be equal or I might expect white and black to occur more because of Berlin case theory and do different weight proportions. So for example, in a goodness of fit test, we might examine if our ethnicity breakdown in a sample matches the current population samples. So we'd have proportions that we would test that against. Independence tests are a little different in that they are um, examining two variables at once. So in this case, we have color by register. And <clears throat> what we're trying to see is if the patterns for each color is the same across each register. And so are those frequencies, individual cells, what we would expect if the patterns were the same, or are they different because the patterns are different? 
Right? So it's almost like examining an interaction in ANOVA. So we're just going to look at these two at the moment just to make this a little bit simpler. Now two by twos do have some weird moments and I'll explain when that happens. Um, but it's a simple way to, to think about these. So we have our observed values. Our observed values are these. So the, the, the count that we uh, collected in our experiment. Different from what we might expect means we have to have some expected values. And the way we calculate that is we take the row, um, the row total times the column total okay, and divide by n. So for black here, we would take the row total for the original here, times the column total down and divide by the complete total total. What that does is it marginalizes, meaning I now have an expected value that controls for the fact that black is just more frequent overall than blue. So we don't maybe necessarily expect to split this 25% in each box because we already know that black is just a more frequently occurring word than blue. I remember at the beginning of the semester, I said, if you don't know the answer, it's frequency. And that's really true here for chi-square. We don't want to assume e equality in all four cells, meaning 25% in each cell, because we already know that black is just more frequent. So we would expect more in the black row than we might in the blue row. Um, and so by calculating this as row total times column total divided by n, we're uh, controlling for that fact. So I made myself a um, little data matrix that has the E values. I calculated the row sums and the column sums. And then there are faster ways to do this, but just to show you what's happening for row one, column one, I did row sum for row one times column sum for column one and divided by the complete sum, the total amount of black and blue mentions across these two registers. Okay. And did that for all four of them. And then I printed it out. Okay. Now, um, you might expect you just get the observed values back, but what actually happens is it can kind of proportionalizes based on row and column total, right? And so what that means is that there's just automatically going to be more up here on the black one, and it's actually equal to the number um, row-wise as here. So it takes in, uh, uh, how many are in the black row already and sort of adjusts where you might expect them to be given how many are in the total for spoken and the total for fiction. Okay. So what we're really creating is an expected proportion and then making that back into frequencies. And you can already tell that these two things are not exactly the same, which uh, is good. And I have a spot here in a minute where I have them on the same slide so you can see this a little better. Okay. Now, I could use the chi-square.test base r function. This is much faster, but uh, I wanted to make sure I really explained how it's calculating those underlying uh, expected values. Now, this is exactly what parts of DCA, or distinctive colexeme analysis, are doing. This is uh, a whole chapter on association. Many of those measures use chi-square as sort of its underlying test. We've talked about Fisher's exact this semester. That's a form of chi-square as well, with a different way to calculate the p-values than the, um, I think it's Pearson's, you know, correction, or Pearson's like estimation on what p should be. Fisher's exact is you calculate all of the possible combinations and how many, um, combinations are different or more extreme than yours, something to that effect. Okay. So we could calculate this using chi-square.test, and when you, when you run that, you run it on a frequency table. So the input there is frequency. You can also put, I think, put in a column of X's and Y's, but don't quote me on that without looking at the um, help guides. I always just put in a table, and it actually saves the expected values for you. So you can see mine are very close, right? Um, they should be exactly the same. Now I also told it to print out the observed values so that you could see, can we could compare directly. So observed wise, I got about 20,000 blacks in the spoken category, but 
it seems to only want to expect about 17,000. And that extra 3,000 that shifted over to fiction, it's expecting more in fiction just because fiction is more likely. Okay, there's more words here. Um, and so I'm possibly observed over the value for spoken and under the value for fiction. Uh, pattern's actually the same for blue, or I'm sorry, it's the opposite for blue, where I, I'm under the expected value and then over the expected value. Okay. Now, I don't know if those are significantly different, so let's look at how the actual test statistic is calculated. Okay. So the formula for chi-square is the summation of each observed cell minus each expected cell, so you pair them up, so it's uh, observed ij, right? Um, observed cells minus expected cells squared divided by the expected cells. This formula hopefully looks very familiar. It is the same idea of standard deviation, which is x minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1, depending on the day. Um, and so here what we see is that it's a similar idea. How far away is the observed values from the expected values? If I were to simply uh, subtract them and sum them, it would sum to zero. So we're going to square that to keep everything nice and positive. Uh, just the same reason that we square standard deviation. And then you kind of unsquare it. Chi-square is literally is still squared, hence it's in the name. So we're not going to unsquare this one. Now I did that with my example ones. Right? To show you that this is um, this is either a math thing or because of the estimation or potentially this has the continuity correction in it in base R. I didn't really investigate too much why these are, ter are different, but they do give you slightly different numbers. Um, but there are some corrections for chi-square. Uh, and that's potentially what's going on here. Um, but I took each... Uh, my observed values minus my expected values squared and divided that by the expected values. Since these are matrices in R, it does this with matrix algebra and it knows that I should do one to one minus one to one okay. and then added all that up. Okay. I could, if I'm using base R, I just do this statistic and I get a very similar number. Okay. So what do I do with that? I think Often when I get questions about chi-square, it's okay, I ran it and it was significant, now what? And it doesn't tell you what was different though, just like an ANOVA would tell you that something happened, but not what happened. Instead, I might use the standardized residuals. This is the part where I see lots of different options. Sometimes people do direct proportion tests. So for example, back up one more, they take uh, and do just a smaller chi-square or a prop test on just the spoken category or on just the black uh, and sort of follow it up with a little pairwise test. Also acceptable. I really like doing uh, standardized residuals because it allows me to contextualize the entire square at once rather than forcing myself to go across or down. However, I think there is a beauty in doing the little prop tests because if you have a question of like, is black more common in spoken than fiction, that will answer that question. What this qu question answers is which one is more than I might expect given the rest of the square. And so you can see those are slightly different hypotheses. A standardized residual is something like observed minus expected divided by the square root of expected as sort of similar to standard error. Um, and the they're kind of z-scored, um, but that is based on the variance of the residuals, which I didn't totally, given the R help, completely get how this was calculated. Um, but the idea is kind of like observed minus expected divided by the square root, which I wanted to show you that's very similar to standard error. Um, but the way that's calculated, since these are frequencies, involves calculating the variance. Okay. And not literally the variance. Like, I don't calculate the variance on um, those four numbers. Okay. Um, there's some special magic going on back there. So here are the regular residuals. Um, 
I don't see too many people interpreting these because they're not the easiest thing to understand. Standardized residuals are z-scores. And this is our one kind of weird moment. Uh, chi-squares that are two by twos most often will create this sort of um, standardized pattern because of the way this is calculated where if one side's higher the only other place for it to go would be the other side to be lower um, they can't both be higher uh, and you tend to get this sort of pattern where one's the opposite of the other and they're very large so these are very big differences where black in the spoken register is more often than we would expect, but fiction is less often than we would expect, given the pattern of data for blue as well. And blue shows the opposite pattern. So it's not that black is more common in spoken and less common in fiction. Because if we back up to our actual square, we can see that's not true. It's just that this spoken category, there's more words there than I would have expected, given the entire table. And the fiction category, there's more word, less words there than I would have expected, given how frequent fiction is. That's a completely different question than is there more in this fiction section than spoken. Okay. And if you wanted to do that, you would do a prop test. All right. Now, one thing we can do to help us visualize this, and I'm going to do this on the whole data frame for Berlin K, is make a mosaic plot. A okay. mosaic plot is a visualization of those standardized residuals from a chi-square type analysis. The box size in the plot is determined by the observed cell size. Okay, so this is O. So the spoken in fiction will be quite large for black because the observed values are large in relation to the other um, colors. The coloring on the plot is shaded based on the direction of the residuals. So higher is one color and lower is another and their strength. So more fully shaded means a stronger residual or a larger residual rather. <clears throat> So if I did this on just the two by two, the way we'd do this is to put it in mosaic plot. You put in the name of the data frame. And so I just kind of kept it, left it on our, our original here. Uh, this label axis style is two. Let's just make some of them purple, per perpendicular, not purple, <laughs> perpendicular. Shade those bad boys. So shade equals true. And then I just stuck register variation on here. I'm sure there's a way to do this in ggplot, but this mosaic plot makes it very easy. Okay. Now the size, now this has flipped black and blue and spoken in fiction, right? Um, so these are not quite the same direction that I had them a minute ago. But the size of the black, so the width, whoops, sorry, the width this way, I'm just trying to point here, is because black is a large category in comparison to blue. So these are proportional width-wise to the data. And then also proportional length, height, height wise to the data. So the largest category without even thinking about color is going to be black fiction. Okay. So the word black in a fiction register. Okay. Then spoken black and fiction blue seem about the same. And so this just um, boxes are sized by proportion okay, of the entire square. Then what we see is the pattern. So the standardized residual, that's the coloring. So don't think about the size of the squares anymore. Um, so it's not like this one has the largest residual. This is by the color. So these are both greater than four. Um, most of the time I see standardized residuals over two are significant, so to speak. Uh, that's based on a Z, um, a Z being 1.96, it's 0.05. You could go stronger. Chi-square is very simple to, simple. Chi-square is sensitive to sample size instead of combining words, uh, which means that often you'll get with larger samples, it's easier to find really big standardized residuals. So I might suggest, you know, moving up. Um, <clears throat> and then if the square were white, that would imply that it's not different than expected. Uh, dashed lines are just another way to tell that these are the negative ones. 
All right, let's look at the whole plot though. So all I've done here is do a mosaic plot now on the entire color register. And this would probably be just a touch better if I organized them by Berlin K's actual theory. So put black and white next to each other, then uh, red, yellow, green, then blue, and then the smaller ones here, gray, orange, pink, and purple. Um, <clears throat> so we would, if we had these in order, we might expect that the uh, early color stages have more words than the less color stages. And I think proportionally, I, I'm not running any tests on this, but I can see that, right? So orange, pink, purple, and gray are not nearly as common as black, white, red, and green, and blue. But a quick look at this plot allows me to kind of see the patterns here. So I can uh, go across or down when it when I'm investigating this. So in the spoken register, there is way more black and white, okay. um, and way less of every other color. So that means to me that implies that the spoken register is like early in the Berlin K theory because it has more white and black and less of everything else than we would expect given every given the entire square. For fiction here. We are getting more of our later colors. Okay, blue, brown, gray, pink, purple, uh, red, and yellow. So the colors are more biased towards the later colors, okay, except green, orange here is not coming up. Okay, where black and white are less than we would expect. Academic's kind of a mis ba mixed bag and it's also hard to read because it doesn't straight. <laughs> um, but academic tends to follow the same pattern where it is this the same here as spoken, where white and black are pretty common. Not a whole lot of flair in the academic ones. And then press is also a little bit all over the place. And so if I had to group these together, I would say the academic and spoken are early in the Berlin K, fiction a little bit later, press somewhere in the middle. Okay, because it has black but not white. Right? Um, red and green, which we'll talk about why that happens in a second. Um, and then orange, sorry, yeah, orange and brown are more common. So this is just a, a visualization of our chi-square results. Where does that lead me today? Well, today I want to talk about simple correspondence analysis and then multiple correspondence analysis. And what this does is it identifies the systematic relationships between variables in a low dimensional space. So we worked with low dimensional space already using multidimensional scaling and multidimensional scaling, that's it. <laughs> and then um, cluster analysis kind of fits in a strange place because you can have many, many clusters, but often the purpose of the analysis is to keep it in low dimensional space and only have a few clusters, but you could have many. Um, then we also worked in high dimensional spaces. So things like PCA and EFA, where one could have many factors or many um, components and then really big dimensional spaces looking at semantic, ve semantic vector space models, so topics and LSA. This analysis fits more with multidimensional scaling. So it allows us to look at a few dimensions. So this is very similar to, like I said, MDS. Uh, if you only did a couple of dimensions, PCA and EFA. PCA and EFA, remember though, allow you to go into more dimensions you could do five or six in a multidimensional scale, but it would be hard to interpret. Very easy to run. We'll use the CA library for correspondence analysis. And then the function is CA and you put it on a frequency table. So let's look at that output. Now the output does get quite long. Um, and so we're gonna talk about each piece kind of one at a time here. And we'll start by focusing at the top and then move our way through the, through the rest. So inertia is the first thing that you'll see at the top. Okay. And it's a table of, of inertias. Okay. Inertia isn't, um, I mean, they're listed as eigenvalues, right? 
but uh, mostly the focus is more on the proportion of variance. Uh, when we've talked about eigenvalues, we've talked a little bit about how sometimes they're not the most useful things because um, they're hard to interpret, right? It's a six. Okay, what does that mean, right? Is it 6%? No, it's like 87% of the variance. And so eigenvalues are really great for looking at scree plots, thinking about, you know, what's the largest variance clusters. Um, so the, the inertias here get translated into these um, per percents, which are much more useful. And so it explains us how much variation is accounted for by each dimension and how many dimensions one might need to capture the most variance. So kind of more of a PCA style. So that's very similar to the eigenvalues that we've been talking about since multidimensional scales. And we want to try to represent the relationship between variables in as few dimensions as possible. So the goal here is low dimensional space. Simplicity. Okay. In this example, um, I just cut and pasted this, the first two dimensions account for 97% of the variance. It's pretty good. And if we add the third dimension, then we get all the variance. Okay. So first two dimensions capture nearly all the variance, third dimension captures all of it. Okay. That's really great. We could work in two dimensional or one dimensional, uh, three dimensional space. Sorry. I guess if you only wanted one dimension, it covers a lot of the variance too. We use a plot function to plot this. It looks all like, like if I hadn't shown you which plot this was, I don't think you would know, right? We've looked at several of these plots. So anytime I see a plot like this, I'm always like, okay, which analysis is it? Is it PCA? Is it MDS? Is it a fancy cluster plot? <laughs> like a K-means plot? What's happening? Um, but it gives us the same... Uh, kind of idea for plot. Now then the cool thing about this plot is that it's actually plotting rows and columns. So what we see are the colors in blue here um, and then the registers in red. And so it actually will show us sort of how rows and columns group together. So I kind of get a like a chunk over here if I might put a circle around these and it's, it matches the mosaic plot that I just showed you where fiction tends to be mostly some of the later colors. So if I think about this for a second, when people are writing fiction, they're having to explain to you, they're having to create a mental picture for you. So of course they're gonna tell you what color it is. Press, we've got red, green, and orange, and I won't spoil it for you why press seems to have more red and green and sort of halfway to white and black. And then academics and spoken are pretty heavily white and black. Okay, they're the closest together. And it's clear that the academic register is very different from the rest. Okay. So I would interpret that. And I would say, um, oh, how are these plots different than the ones we've been making? Uh, they aren't. So terms are close together if they have similar frequency counts. Before we were saying that these had the same um, at a multidimensional scale, they were on, on the same distances, um, the same dimensions, sorry, wrong word. Uh, PCA and EFA, we were saying that they had the same pattern of relationship to each dimension. So they were all positive or all negative or um, were stronger for, you know, factor one over factor two. Okay. Here we're working with categorical variables. So we're going to say they have similar frequency counts rather than similar distances or similar um, um, factor loadings, which are contiguous. Okay. And so that means they have similar profiles, right? They have a similar relationship to their dimension, we can call this a latent variable if you want. Okay, dimension's a broader word. Okay. And those dim distances on this plot are a representation of those chi-square values. So it's how much the um, chi-square values of each row and college column differ from an average profile. So if I take the average of all of my rows, this would be the center. So it's a six centroid, kind of like Mahalanobis. Right. And um, the distance from the centroid is what's being plotted. So how different is my pattern of chi-square different from an average pattern of chi-square? 
So does this match theory? So back to why is, why is this the way it is? So uh, what we can say is that the fiction register tends to represent the, the later levels of Berlanke. Okay. The academic and spoken register are a little bit earlier. Press here is kind of an odd one in kind of this, because uh, orange, orange is the real odd one out. Um, but uh, it's kind of here in this red green kind of area. So press is somewhere in the middle. And the reason that press is close to red and green is partially due to culture. So we've talked a little bit this semester about how you can't separate language and culture, and here's a good example of that. So there are proper names for certain things like the Red Cross and the Green Bay Packers that occur in press, and that tends to be what is biasing um, some of these results. So now, if we looked at American press in the last five years, you might see that black even shifts more towards press because of things like Black Lives Matter. Okay. So um, again, this is a good example of how culture and language don't necessarily come apart and those these analyses can elucidate those things for us. So fiction is likely closer to the later color terms because of like painting a picture for our for the reader. And academics are pretty boring, right? So we're talking about things are white and black. And so that's a good academic joke about how things are either significant or not. But it's also um, probably because unless you're researching color, right? You're not going to, um, things are going to be presented on a white screen or you're just not going to use these quite as much. Okay. At least in my writing. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. We can also make this into a 3D plot. Now let me back up and go over here. Because those obviously don't print in the slides. Alright. Again, these would be great candidates for things like Plotly. But if you just need to look at it really quickly and you don't want others to interact with it, now I can look at it in that third dimension so I can capture all of the data. And now we can see something interesting about how white and black are actually not totally on top of each other. I right, see white's a little higher in that third dimension and spoken earlier when looking at it flat, this would be flat, looked like it was super on top of white and black, but it's actually not, it's a little below it. So we can see more of these fine grained distinctions where um, white and black are not the exact same profile and spoken um, here is not totally tightly on top of those. Uh, we can do the same thing for the other side. You see that gray is really far out. It's not matching the pattern of any others, right? But blue here, which is an earlier color term, doesn't totally smash on top of all of the rest of them. So the nice thing about this is we can get a little bit more of a distinction, whereas when we look at it only flat, if I can, <laughs> now I can't make it happen, here we go. It would look sort of like spoken and black were the same thing, but by adding that third dimension, I can tell they're not quite the same. <clears throat> All right. So to switch topics here just a little bit, um, we're going to look at now a multiple correspondence analysis and really get into um, categories. Okay. So a super quick reminder of the slides on categories. So what's a category? Okay. It's a group or organization of related things, objects. Um, things is a good word for this. Uh, a concept would be a member of a category. So I might have category be dogs and that concept be beagle. Um, I didn't talk about my little dog that wanders around sometimes in these videos. Um, so we could also do animals, which is a lot um, more super, super ordinate category, right? More abstract. And then dog, cat, fish, bird. Okay. We talked a little bit before about family resemblance <laughs> models and we're gonna come back to this concept now or we have things like prototype theory and exemplar theory, where prototypes are abstractions 
that's sort of the best example of a category. This is really good for very large categories with many examples. So it's kind of the average of them. Um, and so they may not exist in the real world, but they're really good representations of, of our experiences. Or as exemplar theory says that we store a specific example in memory. This is probably better for smaller categories. And the purpose of having these is to determine if something is in a category or not, or to know what to call it. <clears throat> and so that idea is that things are um, instances. Uh, category includes detailed information about each range of instances or experiences. These two theories are very, very similar. Um, the core distinction is how the um, category comparison occurs. It's occurring to a prototype with an abstraction or an exemplar, which is a specific example. It's really the main difference between these two ideas. And we probably do both. So when you're thinking about categories, I always like to think about what would a kid call this? And think about um, how would I know what to call something? And I would need to compare this new thing that I'm seeing to a stored representation of the category, and then I can decide if it's in or out. So we're gonna use an example, um, um, basically from Ikea. <laughs> so is there a difference between categories for chair, and I don't know how to say this, stole would be my guess, um, and armchair or a Cecil. Um, <clears throat> and so in the 1950s, so 1959, this uh, Gipper had people name chairs. Here's a picture, what is it? Just tell me what it is. Okay, this is like interestingly simple research, right? To look at the relative frequency of using chair versus armchair. Obviously, this doesn't translate very well. I don't know that I think that many people in American English would call something an armchair, right? Um, but the idea is that maybe these are two separate things. So when someone says chair, they mean a different thing than armchair, or are these two of the same thing, where it's just one of those weird things where people have two different names for the same category. And in looking at this work, and then we'll kind of play with an example here, what, we f what he found, he, I'm assuming, um, is that things that are labeled chairs are functional. Right? So a, a desk is, a desk chair is functional, right? uh, or an office chair. Whereas things that are labeled armchairs are more comfort-based, like a lazy boy, right? Or a, um, what would another word for this be? I can only think lazy boy because that's the idea that like a like a band-aid right where you can't get over, you can't get past the uh brand name but um like a a, a a big fluffy chair so let's look at that data the data is in the arling package it's called chairs okay. and this is obviously newer data where the data is coded from an online shop looking at their text descriptions and other ch sort of chair related variables. So um, Ikea is hanging out here, right? And so it's got the category that, that it would have been classified in based on its description. It's function, so like a dining room chair, not specific, just a regular old chair. Uh, work, kind of office related chairs. Uh, who this is targeted at, adults or children what kind of back the chair has, low, medium, or high. Is it soft? Does it have arms? Is it upholstered? What kind of seat is it? How high is the seat? So like a bar stool versus a um, normal height chair. How deep is the seat? Does it swivel? Does it roll? And does it rock? Okay. And so essentially what they've done is they've looked at all the features for chairs. So now we're really getting back into featureless theory. I remember the feature list theory was this idea that categories can be defined by their essential features. And so they've coded the data for what they think are the features of chairs in these examples. And now we're going to see if the features are different for each label. So we're going to use this facto mine R package to really get us some cool visualizations for this. 
we're going to build a multiple correspondence analysis model. So why is it multiple? That's because I have more than two variables. Okay, so a simple correspondence analysis is akin to an independent chi-square where I have uh, rows and columns only. Here I have um, where it's rows and columns, meaning uh, those are two variables and each of their levels. Right here I have multiple variables and they have multiple levels. So these analyses are done on categorical data, which is different than what we've been doing, where multidimensional scales and EFA and PCA and cluster analysis um, and high dimensional spaces are mostly only done on continuous data. Not perfectly, you can do some on categorical data, but they generally are done on continuous data. So I'm gonna use the MCA function and then throw in here the data set. Okay. Notice here that the data set is not a frequency table, it's the raw data. Okay. And I've subtracted out the first three columns because they're just, at the moment, we don't want to use category. Um, and these two are just for knowing where it was coded from. Okay. So I don't really need to know if the IKEA chairs are different, although it could be an interesting question. Turn off the graph temporarily and get our summary. Okay, so we still get those inertia eigenvalues. Uh, looks a little different because the function is different. Okay. And um, what I can see here is that the dimensionality is based on um, the number of variables, I believe. And uh, we at first getting 15% of the variance and 12%. So this is more kind of of our normal analysis where the dimension variances are not quite as large as that last analysis. Um, and so we'll calculate this in two dimensional space, but we could also do three dimensional space. And we would only get like a quarter of the variance with the caveat that there's some um, disagreement over whether these are appropriate. Okay. And we'll look at some other ones here in a minute. Okay. Now I can plot this, it's gonna be very hard to read. Um, CX here is for the size. The color for the variable is black. The color for the indicators here is gray. And I'd actually tell you to turn off the indicators because right now this is row names. And before that made sense um, because the row names were a small number of things, but now the row names is every instance of a chair. And so it's really hard to, to read. But I would say overall, the whole shebang is hard to read. Um, but you could turn off those indicators. I forget exactly how. I think, I don't remember if you just turn it off, turn it off. That'll work. Oh, right. Boop. Let's try that again. No, okay, now it's blue. Uh, there is a way to do it, if I can get past all this nonsense. Uh, t -t 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 invisible here. We'll actually do that. So now I can see that factor map without all of the uh, individual chairs laid on it. It's still gonna be hard to read okay, just because we have a lot of different category options. So notice here, that um, what we've got is the each individual component of each column, right? So the back adjust, right? This is the back variable and this is adjustable or not, right? Um, so each one has its uh, full label on here. Okay, and these are its chairs that swivel and then swivel no will be on here somewhere. Now that can be really hard to interpret. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this back here. I'll leave in the other one though. That should get its back perfect. Since this can be hard, so hard to read, what we actually might wanna do instead is just look at the dimensions. Now this does not print on a slide at all really. So let's come back over here and look at that output because it goes on for quite some time. <laughs> so uh, what I would do for each dimension is you could look at several things. 
First thing that happens is you get the R squared value. This is how much of that variable is accounted for with that dimension. And they are in um, descending order. So um, this first dimension is heavily comprised of upholstery, the type of seat, its function, it's soft if it swizzles, swizzles <laughs> if it swivels, and then it decreases. So it actually will show you all of the ones that are significant, where r squared is greater than zero. But I would say the, the, the bigger they are, the more weight they carry in that category. Then here we get some estimates. Okay. I do think you see all of the combinations. So for upholstery, no, this category is pretty high. So then you'll also see upholstery, yes. They will usually be opposites of each other because the you know, there's only two of them. And you'll see p-values for those as well. Um, here what I would do is I would pick the strong ones. So um, even though back here, recline back, uh, here's back, is not the one of the highest R squared ones, it does have one of the strongest weights. Oh, now I've lost it, sorry. <laughs> here we go, back low. Okay, so a low back chair, and you can kind of um, look at the largest of these. So a low back chair uh, with a high seat, this so far sounds like a bar stool, right? With a little back. That, let's see, is not specifically labeled and it's not upholstered. So to me that kind of sounds like a bar stool. In our second dimension, uh, what we can look at keep scrolling here, is that we're going to see adjustable seats. So the back is adjustable. The seat depth is adjustable. It's a work chair. So this sounds like an office chair. Okay. It doesn't recline back because it's not a lazy boy, right? but it does adjust in different ways, up and down. Um, and uh, swivels and rolls. And then we can keep going and look at the third dimension if we wanted to as well. Each dimension will have slowly have less and less variables associated with it. And this looks more like outdoor variables. Okay. So they're metal. Okay. Most metal chairs are outdoors. It is also outdoor. It's got a soft pad on it because sitting on metal is not any fun, right? Um, and then it will be the opposite of the strong ones here. So add functions table. Uh, I don't actually totally know what that one is, but uh, it's not a high seat, right? So it's the opposite of a high seat. So you just kind of go through those. Okay. And this is totally interpretive dance, so you would have to kind of think about what does this combination represent? Okay. So our square values represent the variables uh, association with that dimension, how much I'm, the variance I'm accounting for, the p-value represents the strength, uh, the category part gives you this sort of directionality and strength as well. If the value is positive, that means on our plot, it'll be on the right-hand side, representing a positive coefficient. If it's negative, it'll be on the left-hand side. So our overall interpretation. Okay. That first dimension seems to represent comfort chairs. Now, I kind of looked at a couple of those and was like, oh, that's a bar stool. But if we went through them a little bit more, what we might see is that many of the, it's upholstered, it's fluffy, and it doesn't, it leans back. So it's kind of the chairs you might have in your living room. Okay. Uh, like a love seat. The second dimension is more work chairs. Okay. Function. And the third one might be harder to understand, but if I look at the strongest weights, it seems to me like it might be patio furniture. Okay. So it appears to sort of separate, the, separate these out based on their the room in the house almost, right? So comfort relaxation chairs, that's the living room, adjustable chairs for work, that might be your office, at a desk. And um, from the book, multifunctional chairs for the house, I might argue that it looks like patio furniture. So now what I can do is to kind of augment that previous analysis is I can add the label of the type of chair that we would have given it um, and see where these two things fall. Okay. So we can map that onto our analysis as a supplementary variable. So this allows us to look at like the labels that people are giving it 
the, how does that map on all these uh, features that we see? And so to do that, you uh, essentially do the same basic analysis. I didn't cut column three, or this would be very confusing. Uh, quality supplement or supplemental variable is now the new first column in the data set. The first two columns are where the what shop it was from and um, a label, I think. But the third column was our Cecil versus Stoll and uh, that becomes the new first column. If it's the last column, you put here the column number of where it is in the data set. Graph equals false, so just so that we can plot it differently. And this is where I've replotted it. And now I've turned off the row indicators. The, um, the quality variable now is dark gray, the column call variable. The supplemental variable is black. So this is the columns. It's the same one we saw a minute ago, and that supplemental variable that we just added is now black. So something to notice here, again, we could also do these in 3D. Now let's make this a little bigger so you can see it better. Now we get a, a much cooler picture. There is not a whole lot of chairs with these two labels that represent this over here. Okay. This to me, looking at this, looks like an office chair. It swivels, it's for work, you can adjust the seat height, you can adjust the seat depth, and I can move the back. This is like a chair that rearranges, right? Um, this looks like the reclining chairs that you would see maybe in your living room. Right? And then here's um, a separate set of seat depths, rocking chairs over here. So it's interesting that these kind of work chairs here are kind of cluster or features that I would consider on a work chair cluster separately, but we don't have a label for them. So maybe we've forgotten that there is this separate third category. And we, at the moment, are clumping everything into these two categories. But very kind of nicely, it does place on top of the, the clusters that we can kind of see. Now, this gets better. One thing we can do is flip this picture and look at the actual uh, examples. So we can do plot ellipses. There's two different versions of this. What you do is put in the model, okay, for me it's model two, uh, with those, the quality supplement variable. Keep variable one to label with, okay, and that's where I get red and black here. And what it does is it classifies them based on their relationship to the dimension. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, it classifies them by which uh, column the label is, not by its dimension relationship. That's a different chart. So um, what we see is those work chairs that earlier I was like, this is a little odd, they're all over here, are getting classified by humans as dull. And the kind of ambiguous chairs over here are mostly getting classified as, as Cecil. So these two kind of make a nice distinct split. And this would be our prototypes. So prototypes would be things that are very close or within the circle. So you'd almost have to, uh, and some plots will let you do this. This one, no. Oh, that's a 95%. I didn't want that just yet. We're gonna do this one. Wrong button. Okay. There's something, uh, some plots that'll let you do this where you can like click on the dot and you can see what item it is. But anything technically in the circle would be considered a prototype. Okay, those would be or the exemplar. If there's only one, it's an exemplar, right? So this category, the interesting thing about it is that there's almost nothing that is perfectly representative of that category. Right? It's a lot of smattering of examples. So potentially this has a prototype because it, it has to be an average of all of them. Where this one has some clear examples that best match the category. So exemplars might work better here. Or since there's five of them, it looks like, in the circle, that um, this might be an average of those five. But here it's pretty clear that there's no one thing that represents that category. Um, all right. So at some point, somehow there's a way to like get it to tell you what row that is. All right. The confidence ellipses here for prototypes don't match, so we can consider these pretty separate 
um, at least the the way that you're determining that category label. Okay. We could also calculate some sort of more traditional 95% confidence intervals. So how much do these categories globally overlap? So let me show you how to do that and then we'll look at the plot a little better. And when I look at this plot, I can see that the categories actually overlap quite a bit. So 95% confidence interval would get at least 95% of these dots, so to speak. And um, we can see how much the two categories overlap. Okay. And when they overlap a lot, we would say they have fuzzy boundaries. And that's a pretty common feel uh, theme for categories is that they're never truly distinct. Things tend to have kind of blurry edges. And so uh, this just gives us a good representation of where those blurry edges might be. Okay. And the way we plot that is you do means equals false. Okay, so that's the only thing that we've added here. Uh, before we were getting a mean plot where I was focusing in on what was the most representative examples for each category. Here we're getting 95%. So let's look at that plot a little better. And now you can see that they overlap. I think the dot patterns make that pretty clear where there's some black dots in the red area and some red dots in the black area. But now I can tell that maybe these ones here in the middle are kind of ambiguous. So we could say that the ones that are in this overlapping region are items that could be classified either way. Okay. So inertia here is still, I mean, it's calculated from the eigenvalue and it's essentially a eigenvalue over total, right? Um, some arguments that this is maybe not the best representation of the amount of variance accounted for. So you can use this MJCA, which is a correction on a multiple correspondence analysis, essentially, that calculates inertia in the same way as a simple correspondence analysis. You'll see that the output looks more like the original. And by using two dimensions, we're actually getting 73% of the variance. Okay, so it's just a different way to calculate those inertias, whereas here there are more traditional eigenvalues. Okay, and the book talks about this a little bit more. If I use, uh, to capture the most of this data though, I should actually have almost four dimensions. So instead of two category names, maybe I should have four different categories. So this might suggest that people generally use the first two, they're pretty strong, but there is a, there are instances where three and four break off. And I would argue this is where work chairs come in. As so they're clearly, clearly creating their own little group out on the side. Okay. So some kind of future directions. Um, what I can do is take the uh, model two that we created and look at those dimension scores, and these are continuous, and use them to predict the, the categories. So if I have these dimensionality scores, can I predict which category it goes into? So going back to log regression, or you seeing if there are t-test wise or differences between categories and other variables, etc. So this analysis could be the first step to making a sort of prediction algorithm where I could classify things without having to um, ask humans. I could just math it out. Uh, it would tell me how well um, each category, I'm sorry, how good at representing the categories each dimension does. Oh, okay, so it would tell me the dimension's usefulness at representing each category. And then within that, each variable's usefulness within the dimension. And so kind of in summary of everything today, we looked at a new model applied to that basic color term and category groupings. So we talked a lot about chi-square and how that's calculated, looked at simple correspondence analysis, which is kind of a version of chi-square. Um, we learned how to do both simple and multiple correspondence analysis. So multiple correspondence analysis, I would say, is a little bit more similar to multidimensional scales, but it's still frequencies. So chi-square on speed, if you will. And then we revisited the ideas of category learning and color grouping to kind of show you that there is no one right analysis. So this is one of our final lectures for this class. Um, I wanted to say that what we've 
giving you across the entire week. What I have given you across the entire semester is a lot of different analyses types to analyze human language that hopefully you haven't seen a whole lot of. So we've done things on a traditional continuous measure, so things like regression, right? Um, and then we've looked a lot of categorical analyses because most of language is not continuous, right? So we looked at log regression, we did this analysis, we did some profile, behavioral profiles work, um, and then we've kind of talked about dimensionality space. So one thing that lots of linguistic people are interested in is dimensions. So we worked in very low dimensional space, that's this type of analysis with correspondence analysis, or um, like if you want to cluster in a low dimensional space, multi-dimensional scales, we moved, moved into higher spaces, EFA, PCA, and then um, truly very high dimensional space with LSA and topics models. And so really giving you a toolkit of many ways to approach linguistic data um, that is not simply a categorization or sentiment analysis, um, because there are lots of ways to analyze the different pieces. And I'd say the beginning of the semester is much more about quantification. So applying, um, you know, creating distinctive colexeme scores or association scores or predicting in regression. And the end of the semester is a joke. I've called this all, uh, called this a bunch as interpretive dance. It's creating a picture of the data and trying to interpret what's happening. So we're creating these dimensionalities and plotting the dimensionality space and interpreting what's going on. So one thing I like about this is it sort of moves me a little bit away from traditional statistics, which I spend a lot of time teaching as well, where they were not focused so heavily on p-values and more on creating models and interpreting those models. Okay. So that wraps up correspondence analysis. If you're just watching on YouTube, you can check out. If you're one of my students, let me give you a brief overview of the assignment. Oh, this is not the right folder. Let's try that again. So for the last assignment, woohoo! There's two parts to this assignment. Okay. Um, a simple and a multiple correspondence analysis. So in the simple correspondence analysis, this is from the book, but there is a, a uh, set of data that you can look at that uh, refers to Chinese texts. So it's the words used to respond, to refer to women from the text in the Ming Dynasty. And so the rows represent different types of women references. So imperial women, servant girl, beautiful woman, mother, grandmother, unchaste woman, <laughs> right? Young girl or wife. And then patterns, variables that we want to analyze those on. Okay. So some examples. So you'll create a mosaic plot to visualize those examples. Run a simple correspondence analysis and create me a plot. Tell me what it is. Interpret it, please. Okay. Then the last thing is from some of my own data where we have a bunch of keywords. Excuse me. These are the words that participants saw in the study, like zebra. Okay. The part of speech that that keyword came up with, so zebra is a noun, the part of speech of a feature, so zebras have stripes, and so stripes would be the feature, um, and then stripes are a noun as well, I think. <laughs> um, thank you, that's the dog shaking her head. The part of speech for the translated feature. Okay. So this is where we translated all the words back into their root form, so it's actually called part of speech limitized is really what it is. Um, but we used translated a million years ago because I didn't think about the fact that these were lemmas, but <laughs> uh, I kind of stuck with it. But anyway, so the limitized part of speech. So, uh, you know, if we said something was um, had uh, stripes, we might put that back into stripe. Okay. And then, but then that would be the same part of speech. <laughs> Uh, A1 and A2 is sort of an interesting set of columns where it's the type of affix that was add, added. So for ducks, the limitization would be duck, and that difference is a numerical marker. So it's got several five or ten different categories on numbers, people, so act to actor is a people translation, characteristic, this is things like ION, um, 
tense, so changing into third person um, participle, like he uh, he runs, um, past tense, etc. So the the affix type is an interesting question of like when do people use different uh, features for words? Are they using um, more characteristics or are they using more root words? So exclude that Q column and run the multiple correspondence analysis. Create some me some pretty plots. Look and interpret the dimensions. There's going to be a lot going on here. So you can think about what are the, the highest four or five weights and interpret those. Okay. Um, interpret the R squared and then create yourself some simple categories. So you can look at the words that you've imported and um, pick a few of them. And I give you an example like mom, family and relative are um, three words that I might expect to have somewhat of a category overlap, but maybe not perfect. So is mom completely in the family category or is it separate its own category? And you could change your own words here. And then be sure here to change this to the name of your data frame. Um, so I just kind of provided you some code on how to see only the words you're interested in. Okay. Plot those and then tell me about the categories themselves. Okay. So you do one simple, one multiple correspondence analysis and do some interpretations for those.